All right, so let's start out with, I apply a force to a particle. Uh, assume that the particle has a rest mass of m sub zero, we have it over here. And as we derived Monday, the fact that the mass of an object can be treated as having the, the rest mass times whatever the Lorentz factor is, depending on how fast it's going. So the faster it's going, uh, it has an increased mass, or for some people it has an increased momentum based upon this extra factor here. But for the sake of this, I'm just going to assume it's the mass that is increasing. Ah, here's TJ. Sorry. I'm going to pause this. We'll have the discussion. And then, cool. Although the quantum stuff is, there are definitely certain branches of engineering involving the quantum stuff. All right, however, we're not there, we are here. All right, so I have a particle that I'm gonna push on, uh, and basically I'm going to, I apply a force, I'm going to accelerate it. As it accelerates, it will gain speed, and as it gains speed, it, the mass will increase. So I'm doing work on the particle. So the work is, by definition, the integral of f dot dx, or putting in differential form, dw equals f dot dx is written over here. Uh, we have the work energy relationships, which potentially you recall from 251. And I'm more concerned with the change in energy here than change in kinetic or change in potential. Since we're not dealing with any other forces, the only force that's being applied to the particle is the force that I'm applying, and I'm applying the non-conservative force. Uh, we basically can take this, and the change in energy is equal to the force I'm applying, dot dx. I know that force is the derivative of momentum with respect to time. We sort of did a pseudo derivation of that, if you recall. P equals mv, dv dt would be equal to m dv dt, in other words, ma, which is force. But that's a quick and dirty derivation of it. We sort of did it from the reverse point of view. However, this form of f equals dp dt is slightly more generalized than Newton's second law. Because Newton's second law assumes mass is constant, this does not. So if P equals MV, what does DP equal? Using the product rule. And I'm just going to drop the vector symbol for now. P equals mv, therefore dp equals, are we integrating, I mean, the, the, uh, what do you call it, differentiating yes. in terms of t or what? It doesn't matter. In terms, if you want for time, fine. So, would it be m dv plus dm v? Yeah, that's all I'm looking for. If it were for, for uh, with respect to time, then there'd be a dt here and a dt there, but oh, okay. we're just keeping it generic. So, this change in energy then is equal to v times dp, so that's vm, or put it in a more traditional form, mv dv plus v squared dm. So now, we have this relationship. We have E in terms of mass and speed, uh, but we can take it, we can come up with a better relationship than that because not much of an equation right there. I know how mass is affected by speed. So let's go ahead and take the derivative of this, define dm dv. What would the derivative be?
in unison would be really cool right now. M sub 9, how does that change with speed? Yeah. Right. It's the rest mass. It, it's the rest, it's the mass of an object when it is at rest. The rest mass does not change. The mass changes, but the rest mass does not. So M sub naught. So I got the constant there. Alright. Now I'm taking the derivative of this with respect to speed. So it's kind of like a mess here, so let's clean it up a little bit, see what we can get rid of. Uh, the negative and the negative, let's see if we can actually get a different color there. So the negatives cancel out, that two cancels out with that two. And I'm left with m sub naught times d over c squared times one minus b squared over c squared to the three halves. Now it's all obvious. All right, so because I know where we are heading, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break this up into product here. So I got m not v over c squared times one minus v squared over c squared times one minus v squared over c squared to the one half. So just breaking the three halves up into a the integral exponent and the fractional exponent. Realize though, let me take this one step further. I'm going to break that top up also. So I got v squared over v over c squared, 1 minus v squared minus over c squared, times m sub naught over 1 minus v squared over c squared to the 1 half. Again, nothing earth shattering, just rearranging stuff. What is that? Because m sub naught is m sub naught, but the reciprocal of 1 minus v squared over c squared to the 1 half is just gamma. This is gamma times m sub naught, which is, as Dara said, just the mass. So if this all becomes m v over, well, I'll distribute the c squared, and I get the c squared minus v squared. So dm dv is equal to that. Questions? All right. So I have the MVV is equal to MV over C squared minus B squared. I uh, can cross multiply. So I get C squared minus B squared DM is equal to MVDV. Only I'd seen an MVDV before. I have now, I can now make that substitution. So this is C squared minus V squared DM plus V squared DM. If I distribute, I get C squared DM minus V squared DM plus V squared DM. Obviously, two of those terms cancel out, and what I'm left with is C squared DM. And now it's just a small little hop 
the differential of E is equal to C squared times the differential of mass. Integrate both sides, and we get E is equal to MC squared. derivation once you get, once you realize that mass is equal to gamma times epsilon zero. Okay. So, if I can turn myself into pure energy, how much energy, how much energy is contained in me? Well, we've got a Pretty decent or pretty quick approximation. My mass is about 100 kilograms. Speed of light, about 3 times 10 to the 8 squared. So that ends up being 3 times 10 to the, to the 18. That's how much energy is stored in me. If I want to figure out how long could I power a 60 watt light bulb. Well, a 60 watt light bulb uses 60 joules of energy per second. So I've got that amount of energy being used 60 joules every second. So that's so if I multiply that times second 60 joules, doing the fancy math there, that's uh, five times 10 to the 16th. Which yeah. sense? Wouldn't it be nine? It would be. It would be. Thank you. Which changes this number to 1.5 times 10 to the 17. Yeah. All right. Uh, number of seconds in a year. You looking it up, Sarah? I assume. seconds per year. So if I divide that by that, that's a myself to pure energy. Uh, how long did I run a 60 watt light bulb? Uh, okay. So first figure out how many seconds that would be. Is that and now in terms of years. Is that seven or a six? That is a seven. So if I convert myself into pure energy, you got the same number? Yeah. Okay. Pure energy, I can run a 60 watt light bulb for almost five billion years. I suspect the light bulb would have decayed by then. But this also, this idea of doing energy and mass, the fact that E equals MC squared, one of those confusing points of naturalized units. Naturalized units are ones where they decided, let's get away from artificial units, things that people have created. And let's take some of these constants and just set them equal to one. Figure there is a unit system that exists where the speed of light is one. So if you deal in those units, you now have broken our equation down into E equals M. Personally, I'm not a fan of it because if you're letting the speed of light equal one, that's very difficult to translate into other conversion systems because you don't know if you're given just a generic equation. Is there a C in there somewhere? Is it C squared? Is it C to the third, C to the first power? It's difficult to translate, but 
theorists do it probably for no other reason than just to confuse people who are theorists. Gravitational constant equal to one. Those are the main two that I've seen. Uh, you're not dealing in theorists don't deal in numbers; they deal in letters. So it's fewer letters to deal with. I don't know if I addressed your question or not, but yeah, you did. Okay. So if I take a proton, or any particle, and I start pumping energy, energy into it, the more energy I put into it, well, it's gonna speed up to start with, but at some point it's not gonna really speed up significantly, and what you end up having is just more and more mass. And so now if I take that particle, and again, the closer I get it to the speed of light, the closer, the gallon gets bigger and bigger. And then I smash it into something, I have so much energy stored in it that I can get a shower of particles out. So I can start with a single proton, smash it into another proton, or take two electrons, smash them into each other. If those particles are traveling near the speed of light, I can get incredible amounts of, of massive particles out of that. So that's the use in high energy physics. And there was one other topic I wanted to hit. So it's gonna seem like an abrupt transition here. And I carefully wrote it all down. And uh, potentially, oh, wait, nope, there we go. Just thinking I might have left it in my office, but nope, there. Okay, questions before we talk about Doppler shift? Things go really fast, they get shorter and heavier. Yep. And time does not pass as quickly for them. In some sense, you become more overweight, but you live longer. I guess it only works if you do the mass gain through speed and not through food. We will, as tradition, start with two reference frames. I'm going to take my S frame and my S prime frame. S prime frame is moving at some velocity, the velocity of S prime with respect to S. I am just going to cleverly label V. That's supposed to be a V there. When so I've got my x prime axis and my x axis. So when x prime is equal to x equals zero meters, I synchronize the clocks. So I imagine that this is Earth and a rocket passing by. When the rocket gets lines up with Earth for that brief moment, we synchronize the clocks. So we synchronize the clocks, so t equals t prime equals zero at that moment. And also at that moment, a signal is sent from S prime to S. So we'll call this event one. Pulse, oh, let's call it pulse sent S prime to S. And then event two. Pulse received. by S. Because they are right next to each other to that point, we assume that they are close enough so that there's no time lapse at all. So if I look in the S frame, this first event happens at, looking at the coordinate pair of XT, uh, in the S frame this happens at zero meters, zero seconds. 
it's received at zero meters and zero seconds. And in the S prime frame, zero meters, zero seconds. And from S prime's point of view, S receives it, from well, the rocket's point of view, Earth receives it at that instant, so zero meters, no time has passed. So we're establishing sort of a baseline to start with. At this point, and so it's going to send out pulses at a regular basis. So S prime, this rocket is moving along. It sent it out, sent out a pulse when it lined up, and then at some time later, it sends out a, another pulse. So event three, second pulse sent. So from S prime's point of view, it happens at zero meters because from S prime's point of view, it hasn't moved at all. And it occurs at some time. Which I would label as T E prime. From the Earth's point of view, or S's point of view, S prime is already zipped on. The time it has gone is, uh, or the distance that S prime has gone is however fast it's going, times some time on Earth. And it happens at this at this time on Earth. So they know that S prime is going to be sending out a pulse, and so they know that after one hour, one second, however long, it's going to send out the second pulse. And then event four, the second pulse is received. So from Earth's point of view, or S's point of view, this rocket ship has been, has been moving out. They know the time in which it sent out the second pulse, and then it knows, well, it knows that whatever signal is sent by S prime, it takes time to get back to Earth. So it's gonna receive it at zero meters, because 